All right, so today we're gonna to talk about neural networks. It is our first of three neural network study groups. Um, oh, also, if you look at the calendar, I haven't made this change yet, but um, I'm actually gonna push the last neural network study group by one, just so I can introduce the project before the last one. But anyways, you'll see it on the calendar and I'll let you all know in Slack. So that's just like a little admin thing. But um, what we're gonna go through today, um, we're going to talk about the most basic form of a neural network, which is what is which, which is a perceptron. I will say the only question I've ever been asked in an interview regarding neural networks, um, and to my knowledge, my other students as well, is what is a perceptron. So if you're able to answer that question, I think you'll be fine. Um, but yeah, all of this stuff is pretty deep. We'll also talk about actual neural networks back propagation, which is how uh, gradient descent works in neural networks. And then we will actually build our first neural network. There'll be a lot of terms and a lot of components that we won't know now, but I'll talk about in the next study group. Um, one thing I want to preface this upcoming section um, on neural networks is um, that most of you all will not be working with neural networks as a first job out of, uh, out of this program. Um, neural networks is considered pretty deep. Like we only have three study groups on this, but I would say a neural network, like to fully understand neural networks, you probably need another bootcamp. Uh, so just know that. Um, if you are like confused about something, and I will say the math is also extremely complicated here, um, but I'll point to the things that are important um, and the things that are worth remembering for now. And a lot of things with neural networks at this stage, you can actually honestly take for granted. That's like a quick intro to that. Um, so there's this meme that I found, which is when you move on to deep learning, all of your other uh, machine learning models that we've talked about so far are forgotten, I guess. Um, but also another really cool thing I wanted to show you all is there's this cheat sheet that is just like a chart of neural networks. And from this, you can see that all of these are a different kind of neural network, which is pretty crazy. So the ones that we're going to talk about today are going to talk about a perceptron, which is, as you see, the simplest form of a neural network. Um, we're also going to talk about deep feed forward neural networks. These are just regular. These are actually the most common, like run of the mill neural network. Um, <clears throat> in our curriculum, we also have recurrent neural networks, LSTMs. There's also a little bit of reading with GRUs. So that you might see in the appendix. Um, Autoencoders, this is what creates word embedding. So uh, today or tomorrow, depending on the time, I'll talk about how this is done and how this creates word embeddings, which is what we talked about on Monday. Finally, um, there are convolutional networks and convolutional networks are what is used for images. Um, and image classification is one of the project options for this mod as well. But yeah, all of these well, all of these are neural networks. Um, I don't even know all of them. There's just a lot there. Support vector machine in some way can be um, can be interpreted as a neural network, which is kind of cool. Uh, but yeah, this is basically to show that there's a lot going on here. Whoa, why is this so large? Okay, all right, back to our material. So yep. Neural network is usually a level up from machine learning, uh, but you'll see that there are pros and cons. So really quickly, let's talk about some applications. So application of neural networks, you can actually use neural networks for clustering. Um, one actually very accessible way to do neural network clustering is you, are, you can do clustering on your word embeddings. So basically the neural network will create an output of your data and then you can cluster that. So imagine um, we have our word embeddings where if you remember every um, tweet, for example, will be represented as like a hundred numbers. You can cluster that. Um, you can also use neural networks for pattern recognition, image recognition, time series forecasting. Um, I'll talk a little bit about recurrent neural networks in the last study group on neural networks. I'll talk a little bit about how you can use a recurrent neural network um, to level up your time, time series forecasting. And finally, um, generating new data. 
So if you all are aware of like deep fake technology, that's actually neural networks as well. It's a neural network called AGAN, which stands for Generative Adversarial Network. So some limitations of neural networks just off the bat. Neural networks are really good for prediction. There's a lot of high precision, high accuracy um, with you using a neural network to predict or classify. Uh, but it's bad for inference. You'll see later that there's so many parameters involved in a neural network that you cannot make sense of the parameters at all. So, um, you know, in the case of our previous models where, you know, linear regression, logistic regression, we can do a coefficient analysis or in any of our tree models, we can pull out important features. You cannot do the same for neural networks. Usually when you get a prediction or a result, you just have to take it as it is. Another obvious limitation is that it is very computationally expensive. Before we dive into some actual material, any thoughts or questions before we move on? All right. Um, so first we're gonna talk about perceptron. And one more accessible way to talk about perceptrons is, sorry, I'm just trying to get the screen to center properly. There we go. Is to think about logistic regression as a perceptron. So I'm going to explain these diagrams here, this diagram here first. Um, this is basically what happens in a perceptron. And all of these components are the same components that go into a logistic regression. So what we have here, and some of the terminology is slightly different. So what we have here is our inputs. So this input here is for one row of data. So each x is you can think of it as like one of the features. So for example, in like our, in our classification problem, this could be like one of the columns that you're using for classification. So each of this is like an X column. So you're feeding in your X column, here you have some weights. Um, the equivalent in logistic reg regression is these weights are your coefficients. So you're gonna take, you know, your variable, multiplied by some coefficient, add it together, because remember that's what you do in logistic regression as well. This bias is your intercept term. So you're adding some constant bias to this. And then what you do here is you throw it through that sigmoid function. So if you remember in logistic regression, you would do all of this, and then you would throw it into that sigmoid function that would coerce everything to be between zero and one. That is an example of an activation function. And then you get your output of either zero or one. So if we just break it up with these lines here, this is for one row of data where each input is a different feature. Uh, the weights and the bias is, uh, they're all determined through gradient descent. Um, with logistic regression, it's like a uh, what's the, MLE gradient descent. The bias term is this is equivalent to our logistic regression intercept term. And our activation function is the sigmoid that forces output values between 0 and 1. And then your output is our classification result. Um, any questions about understanding this diagram? We're just taking an existing model that we know and applying it to this kind of notation. Um, so at this stage, would it be considered a neural network or not? Technically. Yes. Well, it's hard to say when it becomes a neural network. I think once you have more than one of these, then it's a neural network. Okay. Yeah. Let's go with that. So this is a component. It's one of the, it is the building block of a neural network. So technically, yes, but no one would call it a neural network. I have a question too. Um, mm -hmm. So I, maybe just sort of have to review logistic regression, but uh, okay. So it's binary, the output zero or one, you said, is that always with logistic regression as well? Yes. So if you remember in logistic regression, this output is actually between zero and one, and then you just okay. round it, uh, oh, round like it that, down uh, or up. That curve. Like yeah, curve. that's right. It has that like S shape curve. Yep. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anything else? All right. <clears throat> so this is the same structure as a perceptron. In a perceptron, the main difference is that the activation function doesn't have to be that sigmoid function. It can be something else. Um, but yeah, that's the only thing that's different, honestly. Cool. So as we level up, 
the perceptron algorithm is about learning the weights for inputs in order to draw a linear decision boundary that allows us to discriminate between two classes. Um, if you have a data set and you throw it through a logistic regression, if you have, you can actually plot a decision boundary uh, that separates your data. Um, so yeah, similar to this, actually what exactly what we talked about here, Perceptron takes an input, sums them up with weights, adds a bias, and then applies some activation function to produce an output. Um, so this activation function for logistic regression was a sigmoid function, but you can have different activation functions. Tomorrow, not tomorrow, uh, the next study group, I'm going to talk about the different activation functions in more detail. Um, and then, yeah, many perceptrons put together create a neural network. Cool. So any other questions about like the building block of a neural network before we begin? Okay. Okay. I have a question, but it might be a little, you know, like too early no for this. Um, hidden layers. Is that the sum portion of the perceptron? Um, not exactly. So perceptron is part of the hidden layer. So a hidden layer is made up of multiple perceptrons. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. All right. So let's get into that. So from this, we'll get into multi-layer perceptrons, which is basically a neural network. So perceptrons by themselves are linear. We must go deeper. Um, basically, something like if you have a data set that looks something like this, something like a neural network might actually help you separate these classes. Um, this is what Edward was getting to. Um, each of these nodes in a hidden layer is a perceptron. So you can see here we have in this case, three different inputs. So that just means three different columns. And each of the three different columns goes into every node in the hidden layer. So basically what's going on here is the same thing as what's going on in the perceptron. What's going on here and here and here, exactly the same. You might think then wouldn't they all end up with the same result? Not exactly, because they're all working together. Um, so each node in a hidden layer, and this is the hidden layer, works like a single perceptron. Each node assigns different weights and biases to every row's inputs. Also within each node, uh, it transforms the inputs and passes that through an activation function. So each of these nodes has an activation function. Uh, in the case that we saw before, it was sigmoid. Um, usually within a single hidden layer the activation function is the same for every node but you can have multiple hidden layers so this is just a one hidden layer neural network but you can have like another hidden layer that uses a different activation function and then the outputs from activation functions are aggregated to an output so because a lot of these things are happening concurrently um, and I'll, I'll get into more detail tomorrow but if you remember how gradient descent works you start at some arbitrarily just define uh, initial values for all of your weights and biases. And then you work towards reducing your error and reducing your cost function. Um, usually for in a neural network, the initial weights and biases are random and purposefully different such that you would end up with a different combination of weights and biases for each node. I feel like that's a lot of information but does anyone have any clarifying questions at this moment? Hey, Ish. Just uh, one question. Now, when we're talking about uh, right, neural networks, it's like, uh, it's a, like it's a separate model by itself, or it, it can be used as a right, secondary support for a model. Like once mm -hmm. you have run a model and then like you can just add the neural network section. Yeah. Usually it is an alternate model. So like if you have, you know, all the mod three models that we talked about, like random forest, XG boost, neural network can be another alternative that you test out. Okay. So and but, it also can be used as a right a support function for any other models. Um, Let's say kind of so you can use a neural network as like a preliminary step because technically like things like word embeddings 
you're using a neural network to create. So you could use a neural network to change your data in some way that might be more useful and then output it as, and then output, use the output and feed that into a machine learning model. You can definitely do that. Okay. Yeah, it gets pretty, it gets pretty complicated from here. I, I will admit. Could you go back up to the perceptron uh, image? Yes. For sure. So like there, it doesn't look mean there it's, you're having the different, how is it parallel to the neural network? Like this, you said the activation function is a hidden layer. Yeah. So here you have all these inputs that end up with one hidden layer. One activation. You're right. Layer. Yep. So let me just draw a circle around this. This entire thing, this whole thing um, occurs in a single node. So this whole thing fits inside one of these circles here. I see. Yeah. So with so the other within, circles, you have different sigmoid functions or different biases? You have different weights and biases. Weights and um, biases, OK. Yeah. Typically, each of them will have the same activation function. But usually, the activation function is just some sort of like transformation. Like, uh, uh, I'll, t I'll go more in depth on Monday, but basically, for example, it will just change the values of the sum of your weights and biases to coerce the values to be between certain values, to between certain values, for example. It's essentially like a scalar, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a good, that's a really good analogy. Yeah, it's, it's like a scalar. And then the Y is, the output's a single output. So how do they, how does yep. the hidden layer end up with a single output or you get to that layer? Yeah, so with this, they usually sum everything up together. It's like a business sum, okay. Mm -hmm. and, then and then we'll get into that in a little bit, actually. Um, but because if you know that your output needs to be like between zero and one, for example, um, they know that from each node, the output has to be within that range to make it such that the final output aggregates to between zero and one. Yeah. All right. So there are a bunch of activation functions. I'm going to go through each of these on Monday. The notebook is already up on the repo if anyone wants to read ahead. But yeah, I'm going to go through these different activation functions on Monday. So I won't go into that right now. Uh, but I do want to mention that in most cases, the ReLU activation function, which again, I'll talk about details on Monday, uh, the ReLU usually performs the best. Um, and then for output layer, the output layer, oh, something I forgot to mention, the output layer also has an activation function. So um, depending on what your problem is, you would use a different activation function in your output layer. And later when we see the actual neural network being coded out, that will make more sense. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is backpropagation. Now, backpropagation is one of the most mathematically complex things that you will learn in this course. It's basically gradient descent happening all at once for all nodes under all hidden layers. The whole idea of backpropagation is, you know, when you're trying to optimize all of your different weights and biases for all of your nodes and all of the hidden layers, um, one way to do it, which is the way that neural networks do it, is through backpropagation. And how that is done is you actually are propagating your error backwards. And what that means is you will decide, you will optimize parameters from the back, from, sorry, from the last layer towards the first layer, if that makes sense. So first you will figure out what the optimal parameters are in your output layer, and then work backwards to figure out the optimal parameters for layers preceding it. And then that is the direction in which you are optimizing. Does that make sense? Can you give an example of what optimal parameters would be? Oh, yeah. So it would be like the best weight and bias at the very end. It's hard to give like actual numbers, but let's say like the best weight and bias at this moment is like, I don't know, two and three, just as an example for this node. Um, they will optimize it in this layer first. So maybe this has the optimal, optimal values like two and three, four and five. And then with those values, they will next optimize this layer. 
and then next optimize this layer and then next optimize this layer and then see if any changes need to be made again. So it's actually a process of, um, it is actually a process of the chain rule with partial derivatives. Um, I've also linked these two sets of videos are actually, I think, really good in explaining how it works. I will say the math is pretty complicated. It took me like, honestly, like a good half year to like internalize what's going on. Um, but also you will not likely be asked about this in an interview unless you're going for a deep learning role. Um, just to let you all know that don't get freaked out if this is all like gibberish to you. But yeah, any other questions on backpropagation? Usually a potential question that might come up is how does a neural network optimize parameters? And if you just say backpropagation, that's good enough. Cool. So let's talk about some other terms that we're going to see in a little bit. Um, neural networks are implemented with large sets of data. So therefore optimizing for speed becomes a big concern. Um, you'll see that um, if any of you decide to do like an image classification project, each, each neural network will take like two hours to just fit. So it's gonna be very, very time consuming. So yeah, gradient descent can take a very long time to run if we're using a single training example to update weights and biases. So therefore, usually you do it in batches. So some terms that you'll see later on is uh, batch and epoch. So batches, basically, you're going to feed in your data into your neural network to train it in batches. So in batch gradient descent, you pass all training examples through the forward propagation stage before using back propagation to compute weights and biases. So that means you're not gonna update your weights and biases unless until an entire batch and a batch being your subset of your data has gone through. So for example, if I have 1 million data points, you could have like a batch size of 100. And so your weights and biases will only be updated every 100 rows that get fed into your neural network. Yeah, so quick question about that. Wouldn't that affect, you know, the training set? Oh, Since, absolutely, yeah. Like, I'm, I'm assuming smaller batches would ex affect, you know, how well it computes on the training set, correct? Yes, you're right. So smaller batches, usually you get more granularity. You get, I guess, more, I wouldn't say more accurate, but you, yeah, you get more granular with how you're tuning your model. Smaller batches sometimes might lead to more overfitting because the larger the batch, the more you're aggregating the changes in weights and biases. So yeah, that definitely does affect it. Any Anything else to clarify? Yeah, sure. So how would the, in decision tree, like you have something called as the backtracking. Okay. So how is that different from this? I'm not too sure what fact checking is in in um, in decision trees, unfortunately. Is it? Well, I remember the reason I I was just, I remember is like when I was just working on the decision tree, there was something like where uh, what you do is is uh, you are actually going to ch you check how exactly the solution was derived like the sequencing that happens oh okay right so you probably when you're uh, checking all the uh, details right uh, there are programs which help you to go to the previous steps got it got it okay got it so for decision trees mm -hmm. the difference so with decision trees usually you're training on your entire train set at the same time. Because the way a decision tree works is it considers all of your data and then it makes the splits based on that. So you backtrack it, you're basically figuring out, all right, where where did my data get sifted into a category? Hmm. Um, how batch gradient descent works is, um, imagine I have a neural net with some like initial weights and biases. I have a million rows of data. I feed in 100 first see how accurate the predictions are. Maybe I need to adjust some of the weight so that my predictions become more accurate with that hundred. 
And then I keep feeding in a, I feed in another hundred data points, see if the prediction on these next hundred data points are accurate or not. If it's not accurate, keep shifting the weights and biases. Um, so you can see that um, it's kind of a different process because where in the decision tree and most of the models that we talked about uh, in mod three, you are considering all your data at the very start versus in a neural network, because you just cannot learn from so much data at once, you're just gonna have to keep adapting your model to you know batches of data that it sees. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Cool. So other than batch, there's also epoch. Uh, and an epoch is when you're done passing all training examples through the forward propagation. So I have my 1 million rows of data in batches of 100. I fed in, was it 10,000 batches? Because 10,000, yeah. I fed in 10,000 batches. What you can do is you can refeed in your data all over again, just to make sure that the weights did not like particularly tune to like the last few batches, for example. So usually when you're training a neural network, all your data is gonna pass through your neural network multiple times, um, just to make sure that is tuned right. Um, one thing that some people think about when they hear this, won't that lead to overfitting? Yes, it will. Um, so that is something to consider. And we'll talk about dealing with overfitting on Monday as well. So with the, with the batches, mm -hmm. is, is if you run a Jupyter cell, the notebook cell, will, mm -hmm. will it stop at, at the end of each batch to give you a chance like to, I don't know, check it or does it keep going all the time? So it still takes a long time, but yeah. this, but so it's all going on behind the scenes. It'll all go on behind the scenes. I'll actually, and I have an example where I'm actually going to show you what a neural network looks like as a as code, and then we'll be able to see what the outputs look like as well. Okay. You actually will get to see the results after every epoch, but not every batch. I'm sure you might. Not that I'm aware of, but I wouldn't be surprised if you'd be able to extract at every batch. But I normally we don't do that. There's usually no need because you're usually already running so many epochs uh, that you don't need to get more granular than that. Uh, cool. So there are also different kinds of gradient descent, different ways that gradient descent is done. Um, so this will make more sense in conjunction with the other things that we're going to talk about. So first there, are, yeah, there are a couple of gradient descent. So first is stochastic gradient descent, which basically will calculate the error and update the weight after each observation in the training set. So this is without even considering batches. Then you have batch gradient descent, which calculates the error after each, after each example is trained, but only updates the weight after all of the observations has been trained. So in a, like what I was saying earlier, um, it, the weights will be updated as a result of an aggregation of a bunch of training examples being fed into your network. Um, and then you also have mini batch gradient descent. So mini batch is compromised between batch and SGD, stochastic gradient descent, which it splits the training examples into mini batches and calculates errors and updates the weight after each iteration of mini batches are done training. So it's basically like the increments in which things are being updated. And usually most, um, most optimizers, which we'll talk about optimizers. We'll see an example later and talk about it more in depth on Monday. Most of them do mini batch gradient descent. Um, another thing before we get into our example is random initialization. So earlier I talked about, you know, um, if we were to like optimize the weights and biases, um, wouldn't they all optimize the same way? Um, so this is, uh, fixed with random initialization. So when we feed node values forward through la layers, you're initializing the weights and biases with random values and your biases start at zero as well. You don't initialize weights to zero because it will cause training to be pointless because all weights will end up being the same. And then also you don't usually want large initial weights to saturate activation function values, causing taking the gradient of the activation function to be hard. That is caused by the math that goes in that goes on behind um, in back propagation. 
I will say that you don't have to tell it what to initialize as. There are different optimizers that initialize ways differently for you. Cool. So I feel like this is enough theory to get into our first neural network. Uh, does anyone have any questions before we do that? All right. So what you'll see here, there's actually a URL that links to something called Google Colab. Uh, Google Colab is Google's version of a Jupyter Notebook. It is free to use. Uh, what's also pretty neat is you can actually use their GPU and TPU for free. Um, so if you're having issues running things on your local computer, you can definitely turn to Google Colab um, as an alternative. Um, I'm running today's neural network on here on my computer. I can run other neural networks on my own local Jupyter notebooks, but I wanted to let you all know that this is an alternative if you find that um, your models are just taking a long time to run. This sometimes helps it run faster. I will say this also unfortunately has limits. So if I just click connect here, you'll see that, yeah, you'll see that there are limits here. Uh, I don't think they say the limits, but you can see there is some memory limit and there is some RAM limit. So as you keep running things, you'll see this increase. Um, so there's a chance that they might cut off your model training halfway. So just a different alternative to use. Um, but yeah, most students do a combination of this and their Jupyter notebook so they can run multiple things concurrently. Oh, one quick question. So what, what happens to all the, right? Like in GitHub, like we have all the folders which yeah. we've added it up, mm -hmm. right? Now, can we link all those folders of right with this collab file instead of the Jupyter Ooh. notebook? Okay, yeah, you, there's a way that this can actually connect with your Google Drive. So if you have Google Drive, you can actually put your files or your data folders into your Google Drive, um, and then you can actually link it up here. Um, I don't think I have that currently set up. Let me see. Cool, yeah, you can connect your Google Drive here. I, have, I don't want to connect my Google Drive right now, but yeah, you can do that. Yeah, so now the question was uh, the GitHub, uh, data now like all the folders and just putting it uh, on the drive and then just right pushing on to github or i'll just oh okay so if you want to run something on colab you would have to get your data onto here now you can actually export this as an ipymb and then upload oh wait you can save this directly to github as well mm -hmm. so then a version can be pushed onto github okay so the... yeah Okay, so there should be a way like where uh, the GitHub uh, link, it's like, it should be the way, same way, like the way we push and pull the data from Git bash. Yeah, mm, well, because this doesn't exist on your computer, hmm. um, the only, if you want to push it through your Git bash, you would have to download it as a notebook and then push it up. So this doesn't have a direct link to GitHub through Git Bash. Yeah, I, I understand. Knowledge, yeah. I, it's just like uh, I want to figure out how we can directly push all the. Like, see, there would be like uh, images. There might be we more to add. There might be mm -hmm. some other uh, right notebooks that can be connected through yeah. this. So how all those for I mean the entire folder gets shifted to github oh okay um let's... i think you would have to save it separately but yeah we can talk about it when you get to that point oh yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just yeah. trying to figure out like if there is a possibility then uh, right we can attempt a project here so that oh uh, yeah you know once we share once we start pushing the data from here to let's say the GitHub repo, uh, there are all the files and we also to figure out like uh, what happens to all those, uh, what is that? The secret thing. Like your passwords and- Yeah, mm -hmm. so how, how they are saved. Yeah, I mean, I, I will say it's very case by case. Okay. Uh, 
but yeah feel free to play around with it uh, if you run into anything or if you can't figure out like how to get your data to and from a place feel free to just let me know okay cool um so before we get into this um a couple of things to consider uh before we get into the code so the library we'll be using is called keras so keras is the default choice for beginners because it is user-friendly and easy to implement. It is built upon TensorFlow. So some of you might have heard of TensorFlow. It is one of the two biggest libraries used to create neural networks professionally. So Keras is built using TensorFlow. So if you're building a Keras neural network, it's using TensorFlow as a backend. Um, the other big library that is that you uh, for neural networks is called PyTorch. Um, TensorFlow is actually by Google and PyTorch is by Facebook. Um, typically for production, TensorFlow is preferred. PyTorch is more for research, just in case anyone was curious. So things that we're going to start thinking about, and we'll see these elements later in a little bit. First, you're going to have to specify your architecture. How many layers, how many nodes do you want in your hidden layers? How, what kind of active, activation functions are you going to use? Next, I'll talk about compiling your model. And compiling your model is basically putting your model together. Um, this is where you specify your cost function and details about how optimization works. Uh, so things like learning rate, your optimizer, and optimizer being gradient descent, and also what kind of metrics you want your uh, you want your neural network to optimize for. Like you can optimize for accuracy, recall, precision, stuff like that. Um, finally, there will be a fit step which we'll see in a little bit, and then you can make predictions. Um, and this is just the Keras uh, intro guide, just in case anyone was curious. All right, for the code, we're going to import all of these things. This, These are all different Keras things. We'll actually see them in a little bit. Our usual pandas, numpy, and we're going to do a quick chain test split on our data as well. So I'm just going to use this data set. It's very, very simple. For this data set, you typically don't need to use a neural network, but because I want it to run really quickly, I'm going to use a small data set. You can see it, is, it only has 700 rows, nine columns. So I'm just doing our usual x, y chain test split. Uh, typically, you would do your data cleaning and your ED at this stage, but we're not going to do that right now. All right, so this is how you define a neural network. Actually, it looks pretty straightforward. We have a, let me actually, all right, let me take this out for now. Um, so the first thing you have to do is determine what kind of model we're going to use. Um, all the models that we're going to use within this course are all sequential models. So all of your models will start, uh, all of your model code will start with model equals sequential. This is just instantiating the model. Right now it's an empty model, which is why we're going to keep adding things to it. Actually, this I don't need to comment on. It's not really, it doesn't really make a difference. So each of these lines is adding a layer into my neural network. So here you can see that my very first layer is going to be a dense layer. Um, and over the next couple of study groups, we'll see different kinds of layers as well. But our most basic layer is called a dense layer. And this tells us how many nodes we want in our dense layer. So this first dense layer is going to have 12 nodes. For your first layer, you have to tell it your input dimension. So you can see this argument, input dimensions, I have for my first layer, but not for my next few. So input dimension, this is eight because there are eight columns. So you got to tell it how many columns for it to expect. And then I have my activation function being a ReLU activation function. So in your neural network, uh, in this neural network, I'm adding another dense 12 node layer just for the sake of having it there. You can add, honestly, as many as you want. You can tweak these numbers. You can tweak the number of nodes. You can add layers. And um, tomorrow, uh, on Monday, we'll talk about other things that you can add to your neural network. But this is a very, very basic one. Um, so why did you pick 12 for the dense mm -hmm. nodes? Arbitra arbitrary number. Uh, the more nodes you have, uh, you can think of it as the more nodes you have, the more granularity you can get with your predictions. Um, basically, imagine if each if each node outputs a sigmoid function, if you were to aggregate 12 different sigmoid functions together, you would get a much more like, I don't know, bendy line. 
as your like decision boundary. So the more nodes you have, I don't know, the more like crevices and bends in your decision function, basically. So um, usually you start small. If you're not getting good results, you would increase the number of nodes, but you can also increase the number of layers, which essentially will do the job quicker. But we'll talk about more of that uh, on Monday as well. Uh, so to, to go back to the, those diagrams, so would yes. you have like, you know, before you had three as your X's and then it would go to four nodes. Yes. Um, so here you would start with like 514, so that's your X train shape. And then you go to 12 nodes like that. Um, okay, so it goes from eight. So because oh, 514 eight. is the number, yeah. 514 is the number of rows. So it, it, the eight, basically if I were to put it with this diagram, this yeah. input would have eight inputs and then 12 nodes in the hidden layer. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, uh, my, my question was like, uh, what happens to the, like, as we increase this number of nodes, will the uh, speed of the process keep on increasing? I mean, Definitely. It's like we have or either the speed or the time taken. Yeah. Like, will that impact? Oh, 100%. Because everything that you're adding on increases the number of parameters that your model has to optimize for. And the more parameters you have, um, the longer it'll take to train. Well, maybe like I can just start some of the neural networks, go to sleep, come back, and then probably- That's literally what people do. Yeah, I like in my other cohort, they actually just finished their their projects of which the recordings I posted to your channel, if anyone is interested. Um, I have one student who did this project and had like a grid search neural network running for 16 hours. So that's the kind of time it takes to run. Anything we, else? Oh, yeah. You really need a good computer. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> Anything else at this point? Cool. So this model you would say has two hidden layers. And then every neural network has to, or any like prediction neural network, if you're using it for classification or regression, it's got to have an output layer. So the output layer here um, has one node because it's either, it's going to be between zero and one. And then the activation function sigmoid because sigmoid forces it to be between zero and one. Um, so this is the final layer. And we'll actually see on Monday, depending on what your problem is, whether it's classification, multi-class, if it's a regression, you would use a different activation function. So this is creating the model. And when you're done deciding on all your layers, you got to compile your model. So this compile step puts your model together. It also defines the loss function. And loss functions I'll talk about tomorrow as well as basically cost function for neural networks. The loss function, um, again, depending on your problem, you might use different loss functions. You have different optimizers. This one is called Atom, uh, but stochastic gradient descent is also an optimizer, but I'll talk about those on Monday as well. And then finally, you can say what metrics you want to use. So after I run this cell, I will have my model. So let me put another code cell. One thing that you can see is model.summary. So in models.summary, this is our model. It has two dense layers and an output layer. And you can see just with this, this is the number of parameters that it's trying to optimize. So in this like two hidden layer, one output layer neural network, I'm optimizing for 277 parameters, which is already way more than eight because if I was doing or eight or nine, because if I was doing this in a logistic regression, I would only have nine parameters. So you can see how much more intense this will be. So after you have created your model and compiled it, uh, you can already train your data. So this is what the fit step looks like. And there are a couple of things going on here. So usually you should do your fit step to a variable just because you'll see in a, li in a little bit, they store a lot of information in history. So you feed in your X train, Y train. You can also 
give the number of epochs in this step. So how many times am I going to fit my entire data set through this neural network? This verbose equals to two basically is how much information they output here. Uh, the batch size 100, so I'm just doing batches of 100 at a time. And this is only like a 800 row data set. So it's going to have eight batches each time. Oh, only 500 for the train set. So there's only going to be six batches each time. And you see that's why that's where the six out of six comes from. And then you can also feed in your test data here. So when I run this, you'll actually see this in action. So running this, oops, scroll up. You can see that all of this is being done. Passing my data through a bunch of epochs, a sorry, six batches per 100 epochs. And you can see uh, my this is my train accuracy. This is my validation accuracy. It slowly increases with the number of epochs, which is great. This is what I want. So you can see it ends off with a train accuracy of 0.73, test accuracy of 0.67, which is not too bad. Maybe if I had more epochs, more layers, more parameters, I might be able to do better. That's up to you to tune. Uh, but also what's really cool is as I mentioned from the history, you can get a lot of information. So I'm just going to plot that information. So what I've got here is the train and test loss function. Again, what this is differs based on loss function, but it's really just a comparison. So it doesn't really matter what those numbers are. And then here you have your train and test accuracy. As you can see, it started off not so good, slowly got better over time. But yeah, that's our first neural network. Um, this is also all I have to share for today. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, this notebook is available uh, uh, yes. on Google Drive or it will be available? So this is a public link. So I mean, just like a public link, I have made it public to everybody. So uh, you'll be able to access it through this URL. Okay. And with Colab, you can like create your own notebooks and all of that. I will say some of the shortcuts are different from regular Jupyter notebooks. So I personally don't like the shortcuts here, uh, but might be worth a try if you want something to run a little faster. Or you can run things concurrently on your local and on here. Um, I have a question. So mm -hmm. with decision trees, we had a, um, you know, a line of code to get like a visualization of the mm. whole decision tree. Yeah. Is there something similar to look at like the hidden layers and the weights, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I think, no, I don't know if one exists. Oh, actually, um, this is pretty advanced, but there's something called TensorBoard, which is created by TensorFlow and you can actually see your weights for everything. But you imagine here I'm dealing with like, First of all, like these weights don't have any meaning because they are being, you know, like each node is responsible for such a little part of your final output. So seeing the weights is not going to, you're not going to be able to interpret anything from the weights. I would say this is the closest thing you have to that to just see the structure of your neural network. Um, TensorBoard, I personally haven't used it, but I have a couple students who have. Um, it allows you to like see how your weights are changing per node or per parameter. So that could be of interest to you. Uh, but I personally haven't used it myself. So that's essentially like the only thing we can really use to, I guess, like show, you know, like, hey, this is how it's changed from the beginning to end. Mm, yeah, to my knowledge, there could be other things that I'm just not aware of. Uh, but usually for a neural network, at this stage, if you're able to show that your results are improving over time, that's usually good enough. Be again, because like the weights are not going to give you any insight to your for your data. Um, you will be able to, through TensorBoard. I've seen you've been able to. You will be able to see like how your weight changes with every epoch, with every batch. Uh, but, but yeah, what you would do with that information. I guess if you're like a hardcore deep learning engineer, it would make more sense, but I am not at that level, so I have no idea. All right, thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. I have Anything a else? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, first, could you go back to what you did the train with the split between the X and the Y data? I just want to. Yes. 
All right. So basically, you're just saying, but how, how much are you splitting up there? Or oh, 10 size, I see. So it's just 33. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this that's what you're free. When, yeah. you, when you're the fit, you fit into the model at normal. That's right. And could you go down into that final uh, chart with the line graph? Yep. So on the one on the right there, um, notice how they the, the the tests and the train stick close together and they start to diverge. Does that mean anything? Like the point where they're closest? Is that somehow insightful? Uh, for any? I will say at the start, it means less because at the start it could be just due to chance that. Um, because you know there's still a few hundred data points, and this is the accuracy value. So, I would say that it's not significant the fact that they're close together here. Um, here, though, um, neural networks are very prone to overfitting. So you might see that. I mean, so far it seems to be plateauing out. If I increase the number of epochs, it is possible. Let me just run that as we're talking. Um, not batches, but epochs. Let's do 300 and see what happens. It could be possible that you know you get to it like plateaus off, becomes parallel for a while, and then your test results start to get worse. Tomorrow I'll be talking about some ways to combat that. Uh, just because the more epochs you have, um, the more it will learn. Okay, that's pretty intense. Um, I don't know if this was helpful, but oh wait, you know what? Let me rerun it from the start just to see again. So basically what just happened was if I don't rerun the compile step, it's actually going to retrain on the weights that already existed in the model. But anyways, oh. uh, to your point, Henry, um, at the beginning of the graph, this part not significant here, maybe a little bit more. So there's looks like there's like one point here where test goes above your train. That I would say is probably due to random chance. Um, I don't see it. I don't see the test accuracy going down significantly. So I think it's safe to say that there isn't really overfitting here, but if you see your test accuracy like going down while the train accuracy continues to go up, then yes, I would see that as overfitting. Okay. But yeah, there's also a lot of fluctuation if you all notice here. Um, one, because there aren't too many data points for a neural network. So you can imagine these fluctuations could be like maybe like 50 to 100 points being um, misclassified or reclassified with each epoch. Um, so that's why there's a lot of fluctuation here. As the weights change, maybe a couple points that are like kind of ambiguous get pushed to either side of the classification. And that's why it looks very jagged there. Anything else? All right. Well, I, I definitely acknowledge and recognize that this is a lot of very dense information. Um, I have put these two YouTube playlists for those of you who like videos. This is this was very, very helpful for me when I was learning about neural networks to like just get a better idea of how it works. Um, StatQuest especially has a lot of videos on neural networks, and I think I've watched them all. Um, I think they break it down very well. I will say the neural, the neural network videos are much longer uh, just because there's more to talk about. So yeah, um, but yeah, um, the next two study groups will build on this material, especially the one on Monday. I think the one on Monday will actually talk about like some more specifics, like what are the implications of like different activation functions, loss functions and all of these things. And so these will hopefully make more sense and on Monday, we'll actually classify some images. So we can look forward to that. All right then, is there any final thoughts? Well, as usual, if y'all need anything, just let me know. Um, I also have told some of you that feel free to start thinking about your Mod 4 project. This is the last of the topics that you can do for the Mod 4 project. So if you already have any ideas for that, just let me know. Um, there, just read through the project prompt. I think there's a lot of information there. Um, but yeah, feel free to get started. Cool. All right. If there's nothing else, have a good night, everybody, and I will see you all back here on Monday or at your one-on-ones. Bye, everybody. Bye.